Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here, to be back in Europe, to be back in Greece. Um, the COVID has uh, really turned our lives inside out. I'm deeply honored to be here this evening to give these lectures in honor of Robin Haig. Um, everything that I have heard said about him this evening is absolutely true, and I won't add very much to the story. But as I thought about how I could celebrate and honor Robin and his legacy, I began to realize that he not only played an important and critical role in my life when I was a graduate student, but that in fact my own um, connection with Swedish scholarship was much deeper than I had understood before. And I want to start by um, uh, explaining that to you. So in this slide, what you see is Jim Wright as a just having graduated from Haverford College. And I had gotten the bug for archaeology taking a course with Brunildus in Smondo Ridgeway when I was a junior in college, and that ignited me. The department in those years uh, at Bryn Mawr and in the, through the 70s was a remarkable department because it had more Europeans in it than it did Americans. But I was studying with Kyle Phillips, and I got fascinated by the Etruscans and Etruscology. And as a reward for persevering, I was invited to participate in the excavations at Poggio Civitate in Tuscany in the summer of 1968. And I, along with Mary Sturgeon, were given a trench that was a great big dump. I think Kyle put us there because he thought, they don't know how to excavate, they won't do much harm. Well, we spent the summer unearthing every single massive terracotta sculpture and architectural revetment from the huge building that was excavated at Pojo Civitate. We got the Sphinx, the cowboy gods with hats, and in the midst of this, we learned that Kyle, who had been a student of Eric Schirkvist at Princeton, was an especial friend of Carl Eric Oostenberg, and that they swapped visits between Aqua Rosa and Pojo Civitate. So what you see here is uh, me answering a question that Frank Brown, then the director of the American Academy of Rome, had put to me about what we had been doing this summer, and King Gustav Adolf standing next to him, uh, and uh, his secretary, and uh, Professor Ostenberg. So that's the beginning of my thinking about how I was influenced by Swedes. And in a strange sense as well, that continued because a number of my students ended up participating in the work that Eric Schurkvist began at Morgantina. So the connection is deeper than that. After completing my military experience uh, duties, I returned to Bryn Mawr, and Carl Nylander had come to teach at Bryn Mawr. And he brought a European polymathy to the department that exceeded even that that the other professors, Mokhtel Melink and Brunilda Ridgeway, had, and an enormous enthusiasm for everything, and also a kind of rowing against the main current approach to scholarship, which was very, very refreshing for all of us. And you see him here lecturing to some undergraduates at Bryn Mawr in front of our excellent collections, wonderful teaching collections, and, and Carl with a smile on his face. He suggested in a seminar that I took with him that introduced me to a G in prehistory that I read uh, even Per Erlen's uh, die letzte mechanischen Fundstätten auf dem griechischen Festland. So that was just a test of my ability or willingness to read German as a, a way of uh, participating in his intellectual exercise. At the same time, he put us all up on the platform at Persepolis and said, forget about Herodotus or read him through Persian eyes. And so generations of students passing through Bryn Mawr looked back at the Acropolis from Persepolis, a really great way of thinking about the past. So um, I ended up going off to the American School in 1972 as a regular member, and a couple years later, Carl became my doctoral advisor 
and he was taking up the post that he assumed at the University of Copenhagen, and he said, you know, you're going to be, you're in Greece, and you need to look up Robin Haig, because he'll take good care of your interests in Aegean prehistory. Well, I had already encountered Robin in the fall of 1972, when he and Inge toured the American school students around the Cine, and I was really impressed with that project. They were busy doing really interesting work, they were publishing, and it seemed to me that this was a place, uh, a person that I would pay closer attention to. And the next thing we know, he was director of the Institute in 1976, and he began to make the Institute a salon. And as we've heard in the opening remarks here by others, it was a welcoming place for one and all, and especially for students. So I spent so much time at the Swedish Institute attending lectures and seminars, and these open discussions that were done, indeed, as Gulag said, without very much effort, just get people together and let them talk. And I remember listening to George Correz and Christos Dumas and Yanis Saklarakis and a host of other young scholars presenting their research, arguing with each other. It was a salon, and we all felt terribly welcome. And by the time I finished my dissertation, I received an invitation, which I found in my files preparing this lecture, it, it, announcing a lecture that I gave on the 5th of May, 1978, on my research on the Mycenaean entrance system to the Acropolis of Athens. So I became even more a member of that community. And it really was Robin's gentle guidance and also his bemused and quiet way of smiling and, and enjoying what was happening. And these salons became, as you all know, uh, a, a major event, and a major event that had international significance because they really pushed the boundaries of, uh, of Aegean prehistory forward. So he and Nano created a dynamic team that, and is illustrated by this fantastic program at the function of the Minoan palaces, conferences that all got published. And it really was a part of that continuing conversation that ignited and drove in the vanguard the development of modern Aegean prehistory today. Uh, it was succeeded by other things that, that Robin was interested in. After all, his particular interest was the Iron Age and religion. And here we can celebrate uh, the volume of ancient Greek cult practice as an example of that kind of conference being, coming out of the series that he and Nano uh, moved forward. So this was an exciting time. By that time, I was already a young professor and attending these conferences or waiting to read the, the articles that came out uh, was a way of continuing one's education. And Robin didn't stop doing this once he left the Institute in 1994 and took up his position at Gothenburg uh, as, as evidenced by the most appropriate conference that he could have participated in, he and Robert Lafinur, producing the Potnia Conference in the Aegeum series. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here honoring him, and it makes me also reflect on the extreme uh, impact Swedish scholarship and the Institute have had in uh, classical studies and Aegean studies. We've met, mentioned the Martin Nilsson lecture series, and we can think of all of these uh, great individuals, Okerström, Arn Furmark, who really, in many ways, founded the discipline of Aegean prehistory for us. So it's not a small thing to be giving this lecture this evening. And if you'll bear with me, I will proceed into my subject, uh, which is the archaeological history of the Mycenaean palace, perhaps a bit presumptuous. The first part that I will lecture about this evening is called Discovering a Mainland Architectural Tradition, and I will simply review scholarship that other people have carried forward between Early Hellatic III and Middle Hellatic III through I, uh, down into the LH2 period, a period of formalization, where I will end talking about the corridor house as a mainland solution within this tradition that I want to advocate. And tomorrow I will give a paper that picks up where I leave off today and really explores the development of the monumentalization of the Mycenaean palace and how it serves as an expression of different ways of foreign legitimization of that 
society at that time. But before we do that, I'd like to give just a little bit of background and recall for you that the Mycenaean world had predecessors, and there's a context for that. And for those of us who were beginning to study and uh, follow Aegean prehistory, 1972 was a kind of hallmark year. It's the publication of Colin Renfrew's The Emergence of Civilization, and it became a Bible for us. You know, we all learned about the Mediterranean polyculture and about how it was the startup for the uh, development of a civilization, the emergence of an Aegean civilization that ended up with palaces and states all over the place. But today, we don't believe that. Uh, that whole approach got pretty much torn apart by Paul Halstead in an article celebrating the centenary of the British school back in 1989. It's not a Mediterranean polyculture, nor is it a political, a stratified political country. Uh, 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 economy. In fact, the uh, whole notion of a kind of hierarchical organization run by chiefs in the early Bronze Age has, I think, been fairly well dismantled, particularly by women looking at the more heterarchical organization that can be read into the remains of, of, of the early Bronze Age, which is to say that what happened in the early Bronze Age was not a civilization leading to a palace-oriented state palace-centered state. Instead, we have a kind of centralized Southern Aegean tradition without a state. And it's driven towards state formation by a process of population growth and perhaps some migration that is also an outcome of the 4.2 climate event that we need to pay close attention to nowadays that really does separate, uh, create a long transition of climatic stress between the third and second millennium BCE, one of depopulation, nucleation, and dispersal. And that uh, actually has been brought to our fore by research leading scholars, the, uh, uh, the Navarino Observatory, uh, a product of the University of Stockholm, and now carried forward by a team headed up by Erika Weiberg at, at Uppsala, where a very recent article by her team is uh, entitled Land Use, Climate Change, and Boom-Bust Sequences in Agricultural Landscapes, Interdisciplinary Perspectives from the Peloponnese. And if you look at this diagram, what you can see here is a representation of maximum and medium uh, calculations of the extent of possible land use relative to climate index. And so we start with EH1, and we go all the way down to the Middle Roman period. And as we fall off at the end of the early Hellenic period into EH3 and then on through MH with a rise in MH3 and then this tremendous upswing, if the max is correct, of, of land use during the Mycenaean period and then a dramatic fall off around 1200 BC that's demonstrated from the study of speleothems in the Peloponnesus that show increasing uh, a, a, a dramatic drought that brought on the Dark Ages, that brought on the, the early Iron Age. And so that is a framework for both sides of, of the period. And moving forward, let's just pay a little attention to the longboat society that did precede it. Because one thing that we need to keep in mind and realize is that the longboat was, a, was an insular society in terms of its circulation within the Aegean and connections to the Balkans and connections to the Near East were overland connections, particularly over the highlands and not really including the Eastern Mediterranean in a meaningful way. Now, when you get to the end of that, what Broodbank put together in his 2000 book on this subject was reconnections that began at the very end, during the end of the early Bronze Age and the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, how these connections were put back together. And he suggested that there were three networks, a south, uh, a, a south, a south network that connected regions like the, the Argolid and the eastern Peloponnesus through the uh, island of Kithra with Crete, and a, an island network that went from Egina all the way across to southwestern Turkey, and then this northern Aegean network. But one of the things that really dramatically changed the shape of things was the introduction of the sail, which really broke people out of that boundary. And uh, in a recent book 
by Tom Tartarin, he has argued that we really should be talking about a Mycenaean maritime culture region. And a major reason for this argument is because the Aegean world became connected with the Near East and with the Eastern Mediterranean because of the advent of the sail. What I want to argue tonight is that it was not an omission of Broodbank, it wasn't his writ. My writ is to describe a mainland tradition. And I think that it's time for us to look at the rest of the Aegean through mainland eyes. And I want to argue that that tradition is well understood when we take into account the architecture of uh, mortuary facilities and the architecture of households and monumental buildings on the mainland. And I just want to make sure that you understand that when the Mycenaeans emerged and began to connect up with these networks, although this shows arrows flowing out from Crete, it's equally people of the mainland utilizing or working through the connections of places like Egina and Kythera, reaching out into the Aegean and finding their way to Crete and throughout the islands to become familiar with them. And then as they reach even further uh, into that Minoan network, the, the system takes off. With that said, um, let me begin then also with a brief uh, case study. Asine is a really good case study of a typical prehistoric community in Greece. It's a small world, and uh, it's, it's not really a part of the main area of the, of the Argolid. Uh, it's set off in its own little district, uh, as, uh, highlighted here in yellow, and in the work that Robin and Inga carried forward, one of the things they did was mapped all the sites in the region. Uh, and that really, if we look at the next slide, we see in a panoramic view all the way uh, from, east to, from west to east, you can see the, the area that defines the Sine as a small world. It's a resilient world. It's extremely connected. This is a site that was occupied in the early Bronze Age and continued to be occupied through the, into the Middle Bronze Age and into the Late Bronze Age. It's continuous, but it is isolated, and that may be part of its resilience as well. But it really wasn't in a position to expand. It was simply capable of connecting and being a part of what was going on. And that sort of fragmented, somewhat isolated form, I think, is relatively characteristic of a lot of the societies that we can look at over the larger map of the mainland of Greece as a small world. And uh, to move along is a case study, and here we really have to thank Gulag Nordqvist for her wonderful book that I continue to revisit time and again, A Middle Hellatic Village. Uh, it was a really groundbreaking study that attempted to pull together all the information about Asine in the Bronze Age to make sense of it. And uh, it's very, very useful because it provides us with an enormous amount of information pulled together, and I'm going to focus primarily on the mortuary and the architectural evidence. In architectural terms, we see the development of a village, and that village grows up in the excavations of the lower town that you're going to be celebrating in 2022. And as it goes forward, the Kastraki Acropolis becomes really a village as the development of houses such as B and C and D and E come together and create a series of rectangular freestanding structures that are easy to sit into a village type arrangement separated by little alleyways. And it shows us the evolution of a form that we don't see quite as clearly at other sites where there wasn't such a wide excavation of space and, and uh, architectural form. And when you break it out, you really see the components of the vernacular architecture of this period. As we get to the end of the Middle Bronze Age and into the early uh, phases of the Late Bronze Age, Asini, like other settlements, undergoes probably some population growth and also some stress in the social order, particularly as connections out through the Aegean to Crete during the Neopalatial period heat up the political economy of that time. And this is when the excavations that Robin and Ingot carried forward on the Barbuna slopes are relevant because they they discovered traces of two houses over on the Barbuna slopes that then were abandoned and replaced by large cis graves. And that they are off site. This is an extramural cemetery. And they are as a combination of habitation and then 
mortuary location. Uh, and we already had discovered in earlier work that had been done as a part of the Swedish uh, excavations here, the discovery of the East Tumulus, which even in the Middle Bronze Age was established as a separate burying place that suggests some emerging social differentiation in the community, which then really took off in the later phases of the Middle Bronze Age, particularly exemplified by tomb 1971-3, which is a wannabe young man who wanted to be part of the big boys wanting to be one of the gang like the fellows over there at Mycenae who were burying themselves in these great shaft graves. Uh, his emulation of that is represented in particular by his having some of these cycladic panel cups, drinking cups, and also some of these typical Mycenaean goblets that we know of from uh, from the excavations of the shaft graves at, at, at Mycenae. So that's just a way of portraying what it might have been like to live in a village that was emerging during this period. Now, more recently, Sophia Vutsaki has decided to restudy the entire Middle Bronze Age, and one of the outcomes of that has been a wonderful thesis by Corey and Wiersma, Wiersma published in 2000. 13, and I just wanted to show you how thorough it was. She studied everything that she could find in Thessaly, Focus, Locris, Boeotia, Attica, Corinthia, Argolis, Laconia, Messenia, Elis, Arcadia, and Achaia. And you know, when I was a graduate student and I began to start reading these site reports and try to understand what was happening in the early, in the Middle Bronze Age, we didn't have as much information as we have today. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's been done in her study, and what you see here uh, in one of her graphs that's particularly telling is the, the trend towards leaving apsidal architecture behind, such that when you get down to LH1, all in gray, you have only L uh, uh, re rectangular buildings showing up in villages here and there. And one of the sites that displays this very well uh, and I'm drawing on illustrations from her dissertation, is Eutresis through its various phases of the, from Middle Hellatic II onwards. And you see the elements of rectangularity and, ash, and uh, apsidal structures here in the plans on your right. And as we move into Middle Hellatic III early, we see the growth of the settlement and the emergence of a, a larger house over here uh, in, in the this, this slide on your right. And then we move into another phase of Middle Hellatic III late until we get to uh, Middle Hellatic III transition to Late Hellatic I, and we have this very large house that emerges that's only fragmentary, but it was very wide and long, uh, and, and it displays uh, everything that we see represented in this graph, but also what we see represented in the study that Weersman did of changing house sizes. And one of the interesting and important observations of her dissertation is to distinguish between coastal and inland sites in looking at the architecture of them. So if you think of the new excavations the University of Athens is carrying forward at Plassey out in the Marathon Plain, here we are in Middle Hellatic II with a big megaron freestanding rectangular structure uh, in this settlement that's of considerable size. And we see in this uh, histogram in the lower left, the, uh, Weersmith's mapping of, of house size, MH1 in black and, and MH2 in gray. So we get increasing house size, but it's still relatively modest, 40 to 49 on average, and that, but it gets up as high as 70 to 79 square meters. And what's really interesting, circled in red in the diagram in the, in the lower right, is that the, how much these coastal settlements seem to be dominating. And that's a way of signaling the importance of offshore island connections. In this instance, probably Aya Irini on Kea, but also certainly Egina playing its important role. Um, and how do we understand that when we think about house size? Well, one way is to simply look at the great monumental bow at uh, Colonna on Egina, much larger than any of these others, a great big uh, rectangular building that goes through many phases from Middle Hellatic II down to Late Hellatic II before it kind of fought, fail, uh, steps away from the scene. And uh, the, the final uh, histogram that I'll show here in the lower left, and I've circled and put here 
in Middle Hellenic II where the average house size was for the Middle Hellenic II period. When we get down to Middle Hellenic III in black and, Middle, and Late Hellenic I in gray, we see this uh, expansion of house size that is uh, characterized by that big house at Eutrusis or examples at Kira. And these suggest to us some important developments in the arrangement and structure of vernacular architecture in villages at this time. And we can sort of pulse together some principles of settlement organization. This may not be new for all of us who have studied these things, but we now know with a degree of certainty and a very broad geographic breadth from Thessaly all the way down to the tip of the Peloponnesus that it was common to place buildings around the slope of a hillside in a kind of ring-like manner. And as a result of that, they would often become fortified in the later periods, especially Middle Hellenic III and Late Hellenic I. So this is true of Pefkakia, it's true of Velaturi Thorikos, Brauan, Chiafith, probably, Chiafathiti, Megali, Magula, Galatas, Argos, the Aspis, a uh, fantastic work that uh, Jill and, and uh, Anna Philippe Touche have carried out there that's really important for understanding developments at this time uh, connecting uh, Argos up with Mycenae and events uh, that happened from there on. A lecture I cannot give today and I will refrain from saying more. Um, and down to Ayo Stephanos and then uh, possibly also Yaraki involved in this and Malthi, again a Swedish excavation that stood as a marker of a typical arrangement of structures that Magula Galatas, for example, seems to show is something that could ha happen elsewhere in the Peloponnesus as well. There are some other fortified settlements, Apano Anglianos, many years disputed. Now we know for certain with the new excavations by Stocker and Davis that that was a fortified settlement along with Peristeria and Plassi as well. Uh, and then we don't want to forget the important offshore island settlements of Kelowna and Iirene on Kea. Now, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to be sure we pay attention to the elaboration of burial facilities as an architectural form. And a good way to introduce this topic is to look at Sophia Vutsaki's uh, uh, synopsis of Middle Hellenic mortuary practices that just came out in the publication of the Austrian uh, a conference held in 2015, a really important volume that I'm going to be citing articles from throughout this lecture. Uh, Sophia points out that the middle Hellenic III and LH1 period are different from those preceding in remarkable important ways. As she says, there's an intensification of change and we see it in the rise of so many extramural cemeteries and larger graves. And these, in her view, absolutely correctly represent the emergence of some social differentiation. We're not talking actually about stratification here, but differentiation and the emergence of regional centers and we see richer offerings and more complex rituals attendant on these. And then as she says, the next, oh, and, and what I've done here is highlight uh, for that period two elements that, that really bespeak the uh, development in architectural elaboration, the appearance of shaft graves and of built tombs, and especially of multiple burials in these enlarged facilities for holding the deceased. These, of course, are built by the burying group. So the burying group is participating in making various kinds of statements that can be energetic statements, statements of display, and they have architectural material significance for increasing the uh, various mortuary activities that attend to them, such as animal sacrifice, funerary mule, mule, meals, or various things as drinking and pouring vessels, storage jars, and a host of other increasingly elaborate dedications uh, into these burials. Now, one of the ways that we can talk about this, I think most meaningfully, is to pay attention to another very fine study, that dissertation of Nicholas Papadimitriou on built chamber tombs. It has an equally broad reach from Thessaly throughout the Peloponnesus and even out into the islands because his focus was what's going on with all these other 
burial types, other architectural forms of burial display in that period, Middle Hellatic III, all the way down to Late Hellatic II. And he brings to our attention evidence that we had before us but hadn't really pulled together in such a, an important and interpretive way. Uh, of such things as the Theodoropolis plot uh, structure up here on the left, a burial that has two, two elements, architectural elements to it in Argos. These are elaborated architectural facilities for holding the dead. Or the remarkable tomb row at Mycenae that we'll look at again tomorrow very briefly. This built tomb that is uh, built of, of sl cut stone slabs, a remarkable elaboration, very different from the shaft graves. Or at Nicoria, apsidal built, big apsidal built burial facilities. Or the well-known gamma tombs at Eleusis, here those from Sector Theta illustrated. And the equally well-known tombs 1, 2, uh, 4, and 5 from Thorikos that are ellipsoid in form uh, and, and that really encompass a very different approach to burial than we see at the other sites. In other words, it's the difference, it's the diversity that these built chamber tombs that uh, Papa Dimitrio has pulled together is, is what's significant. There's no rules and no order for these. This is an elaboration of architecture for burying the dead. So you can take a traditional tumulus, such as the one at Vrana, Tumulus 1, and insert a built chamber tomb within it, as you can see in, uh, in the different phases as these built tombs, which we've known about for a long time, are inserted into the core of the of the tumulus itself. Or go to Medeon on the Corinthian Gulf and see here in tombs S2 and 99 other uh, 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 elaborated built uh, tombs that are, can hold a, a, a large number and multiple number of burials. Or most recently, not in his catalog, the remarkable blue stone complex at Elion discovered by uh, uh, Burke and Burns and published in this figure drawn from their recent AJA publication, a, a really exciting and interesting elaboration of burial for certain sets of people in, in ways that really are bespeaking all of this social change and disruption that's going on in this period. And equally true for the remarkable burial complex at Mitru that's set at the intersection of roads and then memorialized um, over time during the LH1 period. So they suggest to us uh, a lot of change that's going on through this period, and it's not driven by any rules. It's re rather driven by exper experimentation in the architecture of burial facilities. And we can also could look, spend the whole night looking at a lot of new excavations that have taken place. I've just taken one here, Migdalia, excavated by Lina Papatsoglu at, at, at uh, Patras. And we have a window into the site here in this illustration that shows the LH1 architecture, a fragment of it, and then how much more elaborate the LH2 architecture is. And I believe that's actually the case, that if we uncover more of that, we will see a denser settlement distribution. And again, it's, it's probably a variation on the freestanding rectangularity of buildings at that time. So in the domestic architecture, we're finding also experimentation and enlargement as we move on. And we see this at Kira, we see this appearing at Tiran's in ways that seem very familiar to us and we just want to put them on the map in terms of a tradition of rubble architecture that has, is informed by uh, hundreds of years of communication across this region that I'm describing from Thessaly throughout southern Greece that we'll call the mainland tradition. I had the luck to excavate with Mary Dabney, my colleague and wife, the excavation of Chungitsa, and that had been discovered by Carl Blagan, uh, where we found two successive phases, probably the same family. Their house burned down, they rebuilt it. And it's two freestanding rectangular buildings, although it's interesting how the first one had little rooms added off on the side. And it goes through these phases uh, of, of construction that, that show how strong, at least for that family, recreating that plan was. As soon as it burned down, they rebuilt it in exactly the same way, uh, 
probably a little bit longer than the other one, but we're not certain. And another excavation by Lina Papazoglu is this remarkable building on Polikroniadu Street at Egeon that shows in the center a, a, the core rectangular building that we often call the Megaron, flanked by rooms on both sides. Now that recalls immediately where we're coming to, the formal corridor house plan, I use Hiesel's term here, that we know so well from Hector Catling's uh, complete and marvelous publication of, Man of, of the Menelaean, focusing in particular on Mansion 1 of the LH2B period. I'm going to return to that. I want to go back to Chungitsa, though, because something else is going on, and I'm not a pottery expert. I'd let Jerry Rudder or somebody come in and present this, but I do want to point out that in our excavations at Chungitsa, in the LH1 period, the ceramics are from everywhere. This is an impoverished settlement. We, we've never claimed that Chungitsa was anything more than a poor hamlet, but they were getting pottery from Egina in LH1, from the Cyclades, from the southeast Peloponnesus region. They were getting some Minoan pottery, and from central Greece, gray minion, mainland polychrome matte painted and fine orange ware, as well as local Corinthian pottery. And Jerry wonders, how do they have access to all this? What was it? What was the marketing or the, the system by which this material was both produced and transported and distributed, such that a small settlement like this could end up with assured repertory of that of that d dimension? And I think it bespeaks, in many ways, the diversity and the kind of freedom of expression that's happening at this period. And that's very much in in, in contrast with what follows. But what's really interesting is if we look at this publication that Michael Lindblom, another Uppsala person, and Jerry Rudder put out in the Austrian conference. Behind this, we're supposed to be seeing the distribution of egg and eaten by chrome. It's quite wide, and the remarkably wide distribution of Boeotian by chrome. What they observe in conclusion, I put up here, uh, it was supposed to come later, is this quote, What's significant, they think, pulling it all together, is the seeming disappearance of light on dark slipped and burnished class before the LH2A period begins, and the failure of both the Egonetan and Boeotian classes to survive into the LH2B period. I think that failure is quite significant. I may be taking this beyond uh, a level that they would allow as an interpretation, but to me it's significant because at uh, Jungitsa in the LH2A period, we see a, a remarkable change in the location of buildings in the settlement. The, the area where the house, the LH1 houses were, is not reoccupied. There's some evidence of LH2 activity there, but it's not rebuilt. Instead, the settlement moves up on the northern s slope where there's a nice flat apron. And these rectangular houses are grouped together with one street separating building K from building L, uh, separating buildings M and N from each other. So there's some interesting development there. And the pottery that is found from this uh, area is all standardized LH2A. So we don't get pottery from all over the place. There's control and formalization that's taking place. So I think that and what I'm arguing here is that that whole process of formalizing is something that uh, we see also emerging in the architecture. And that's how I would suggest we move on to take on the notion of the Menelaean Mansion 1 as being in the LH2B period and, 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 and expression of a monumentalization in rubble architecture that is going to lead us into the palace period, but before we actually have the palaces up and running. And uh, the, a way we can talk about that first is I just want to deal right away with the problem of Ashler, um, and I'll be talking about that more tomorrow. So it's often been thought that the Menelaean has Ashler masonry. It doesn't. It has a lot of cut porous limestone blocks and slabs that were used in different ways. They are built into Mansion 1 and into the remains of Mansion 2. They're from some building that Catling suggested might have been a predecessor building of LH2A, possibly even earlier, 
We don't know how these blocks fully were used. They might have been paving slabs. They might have surrounded a column of some kind. We simply don't have the evidence. And it may be that in that milieu of diversity in architectural forms that I've been describing, we're missing a really interesting building or set of buildings from those intervening periods, at least at the Menelaian. Um, nothing comes of it that we can make sense of. What's interesting, though, is that we have a formal plan with corridors on either side for works, for rooms that could be for storage or industry or just other uh, domestic purposes, although this is a fairly formal building. And one of the most interesting elements is, is these two narrow rooms uh, 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 on the lower left side, that one of which had dis displays uh, evidence of, of having had timbers placed in it. And it may be that we have two stories here. That would make sense if you know the landscape because the, the bedrock above, you could just walk right into the second story. So it's a very interesting complex and it, it's really been of great interest to many of us trying to understand traditions. What I'd like to emphasize is it's a rubble building and that's a big part of the tradition. And it's conti continued and carried forward in Mansion 2, an LH3A building that is a, a kind of mature version of the corridor house plan. It's shifted 90 degrees, put up on the upper platform, and actually uses as a terrace platform to support it the ruins of Mansion 1 below it. So uh, from that, we can then think uh, uh, about where we go when we talk about the founding of the palaces. There's general agreement among scholars that the palaces were founded in LH1. And again, in the Austrian Conference volume, there's an essay by Adamantia Vasilu Gambru looking at the evidence from Ios Vasilios, and she argues that the LH3A1 founding of the, not of the, of the structure that's, the courtyard structure that's producing the Linear B documents, the earlier excavations, is set up on a terrace that was built in LH. 3A1, and she wants to see what else is going on at that time. Well, another terrace structure like that is Petsas House, Chuntas House, and probably uh, up on the, uh, uh, the Oberburg at Tiryns, the LH2B to 3A1 predecessor of the palace at Tiryns that we'll also talk about tomorrow. And we could also consider what's going on at Iklina at this time, where we have that Cyclopean building that's set up on the terrace. And of course, at Pilos, the southwestern uh, building in particular is laid out as a part of the terrace platform. And the question mark is, what did the building inside look like? We don't know because it just isn't preserved, but it may have been a corridor type structure that was set within it. That's what I'll be talking about tomorrow. What I'd like to do though, is to take the corridor plan and see where it goes. So I'll just remind you of what's very familiar to many of you. The LH3B buildings in the Unterburg, Building 6 and Building 5, excellent examples of the corridor plan in the Unterburg. Uh, the Ramp House at Mycenae, uh, Chuntas House, as we mentioned before, or all of the formal and monumental expressions, but still largely in uh, rubble architecture of the House of the Sphinxes, House of the Oil Merchant, House of the Shields and West House. All of them corridor type houses in an elaborated form for administrative and industrial purposes, whether making perfume or cutting ivories and recording in linear B. That's kind of the highest expression we have that we see the corridor house form. But it's also used in a very vernacular form as Ioni Shear showed us so many years uh, ago, 1987. It's quite a long time ago, isn't it? And the Paniyia houses, which are across the slope there, and uh, are really vernacular houses set into the slope side, one against the other, stepping up the slope and using the corridor plan in inventive ways to, that reflect a tradition that is already uh, now deeply embedded within the vernacular domestic architecture of the settlement surrounding the citadel itself. This is then a formal plan that's being deployed either by people who are used to building rubble buildings like houses that they need 
or by architects who are designing things for administrative purposes. And GLA represents a major variation on this theme of rubble-built structures. The, the L-shaped administrative complex that has this Megaron building at the top of it is a system of very well-coordinated corridors that lead to the interior corridor that you can see is a series of small rectangular two-room buildings that are approached from corridors through uh, outer foyer uh, kind of rooms. The intermediate rooms are access rooms to the inner rooms. These corridors are deployed in such an intelligent way in both of the mirrored uh, wings of this structure so that you get at the end another smaller version of the Megaron that you see up in the other. And we have a kind of crystallized form of the freestanding rectangular architecture that has its roots deep in the Middle Bronze Age. But it doesn't stop there. When we go down into the so-called Agora and take a look at buildings E and Z within, we see how they are driven by an administrative structure building E, shown here in the diagram on the right, that itself has a corridor that connects all these different rooms together and then resembles that kind of two-room Megaron-type building that we find. And I think of these as administrative structures that are used to manage the agricultural and pastoral agricultural products that probably are a big part of what GLA is about as the Copaeus Basin is farmed and exploited for agricultural purposes to feed the large population that must have gathered there around Orkhomenos uh, during the, 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 the late Bronze Age. So this is a very interesting development, and it doesn't stop. It extends back up into Thessaly to encompass the large geographic area that I described as a mainland tradition with the wonderful exposure by uh, uh, Adrimi Sismani of, of the remarkable Megaron complexes at Dimini, LH3B in form. They're really primarily rubble-built structures, but very elaborated with these corridor arrangements uh, that you can see illustrated in this one here. So these this corridor form is, is deeply embedded in the fabric of, Mino of Mycenaean uh, architecture as it emerges. We haven't really looked at one of the palaces yet. Um, instead, we'll continue to look at corridor-type houses showing up here and there. In a publication that will come out shortly that was shared uh, generously by Nikola Kukutsa, we're going to learn that the great building that was plopped over the villa at Aya Triada, A, B, C, D, is actually has three phases to it, and I won't go into it in any detail. It's some kind of rectangular structure, and it bears talking about in this context. I think, however, this is where I'm sticking my neck out, that Edificio Northwest and P is, in fact, a corridor building, uh, and it's a remarkable corridor building I'll return to in talking about Ashler Masonry tomorrow. I think it's the administrative core of the great Mercato at Ayatriada, and there's a, a bigger story behind that that's probably a whole other research project, which I'll get into a little bit tomorrow. But I just wanted to put this out here because it's a connection to Crete that I think bears uh, keeping in mind, not least because we already know that over the main administrative neo-palatial building of Philacopi is laid a corridor house arrangement that is the main administrative structure of it during the Mycenaean period. And we have at Gournia the old Heron house that was recognized back in the 1911-12 that is another one of these corridor buildings that's plopped over uh, a, a previous neo-palatial settlement. And all the way over to Miletus in the third phase, LH3A2 to B, there are fragmentary remains of what looks like possibly something that could be restored as a corridor building. And that's a particular interest because it's in southwest Anatolia uh, and its connections with the inner world. So in pulling this all together, the corridor plan, 
is really a core result of this architectural tradition that I've been painting it with fairly broad strokes through the Middle Bronze Age and through that period of great turmoil between MH3, LH1, and into LH2. And then it's picked up and embedded within the palace plan itself. And that's how we end up with the plan of the Palace of Nestor in its LH3B man manifestation or the palace at Tiryns, here represented as a place of great formal processions uh, as argued by Yosef Moran. And that's where I'm going to stop this evening uh, with, with my presentation. I'm happy to take questions if, there, uh, if there's time for it, um, but I'm going to pick up from there tomorrow and begin to examine the palaces uh, in, 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 as monumental expressions uh, taking off from what I've laid out this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.